Hi there, warriors. This is Miss Galloway coming at you from 2020 instead of 2016, which is when the other videos in this series were recorded. So you will notice that I sound a little bit different, um, partially because I am not recording them at the same time at all. But today what I want to do is I want to finish up by discussing a little bit about the Constitution of 1917 and get us at least to the creation of sort of the, the post-revolutionary Mexican state. Um, yeah, I'm definitely going to spend three days on Mexican political history because I am incapable of cutting this topic short. So let us talk about the Constitution of 1917, this incredibly revolutionary document that came out of the Mexican Revolution, one of my favorite documents in history. That is such a nerdy thing to say, but there is a reason why I like teaching this stuff. So here's the deal. The Constitution that was ultimately drafted in 1917 was far more revolutionary than Venustiano Carranza really thought it was going to be in 1917. He was the acting president of Mexico, and he had anticipated a far more moderate constitution than what he was actually handed. And part of the reason why the constitution tends to be way more liberal, way more radical, frankly, than uh, than. <coughs> Carranza had been anticipating was because he was essentially convinced by a lot of people that the only way to kind of control Emiliano Zapata and the Zapatistas was to make a document that was that gave in to a lot of their demands. Ultimately, the de uh, document didn't go far enough for the Zapatistas, um, but it was still a remarkable document for its time. So I can't go through the whole document with you, even though I would love to. But I do want to hit some highlights here because in its like bones, the current constitution of Mexico is the 1917 version. It's the same one. Um, there have been some significant amendments made, some significant changes, but broadly, it's the same text. Now, Article 3 initially established the idea that every person in Mexico should have access to secular, scientific, public education. That is, education held outside of the church. In this regard, Article 3 is really about kind of an anti clair that continuation of sort of Benito Juarez's anti-clericism, right? Like this, this real criticism of the power and structural authority of the Catholic Church. And so the argument here is that education should be taken away from the church and given instead to a secular scientific body. Like, you'll hear the term scientific over and over again in the Constitution of 1970. Now, regardless of what the Constitution says it's going to do, what it actually does once it's enacted is a different matter entirely. So this is sort of like a wish list of things that politicians were laying out in 17. Article 27, however, is even more radical than Article 3, and in some ways it is so intrinsically important I want you to engrave it upon your gray matter. So here's the deal. Article 27 of the Constitution in 1917 established that all land and water rights ultimately belonged to the nation, not the country, the nation. And remember, nations are made up of people. So there's this idea that ultimately land and water rights as held in Mexico can be privately owned, but ultimately at their heart, their real ownership is by the people themselves. And that gave the nation through the body of the state the right to break up and redistribute property as necessary. That is, the state reserved the right to break up large collected, like large collections of land, large haciendas, or um, land owned by foreign land ownership, like the United States, or property owned by the church, break it up and redistribute it. Now, the notion of this was that it would be redistributed primarily to people who couldn't afford land otherwise, and this would include people in indigenous communities. This was a direct attempt to appeal to Zapatistas to essentially say, hey, look, you can continue with your sort of communal land ownership programs. We won't let Hacendados buy up all of this land. You can have your ejidos, okay? That was the general idea. But I want you to remember Article 27, because it is going to come back and bite us in the butt when we get to 1994 and have to talk about NAFTA. 
Then you have Article uh, 123, which protected the right of labor unions to exist in Mexico. Labor unions in 1917. Uh, Think about what else was going on in 1917. World War I, obviously. But the Bolshevik Revolution over in Russia. We're going to have the establishment of the USSR in about three years. And here's Mexico in writing saying trade unions and labor unions, <coughs> they have the right to exist. You should have equal pay for equal work. Now, that's non-gender specific. The assumption was default male. But there was also an idea that workers should be compensated for injuries they obtained on the job. Like, that is a radical proposition in 1917. I mean, to compare that against the United States, in 1911, you had the Triangle Shirtwaist Company fire that killed hundreds of women workers when their bosses locked them inside a factory and there was no escape from a fire that broke out. Like, contrast that sort of labor policy. Now, does Mexico follow through on this? Heck no. Like, do they fulfill this problem, like promise? No, they don't. But they make the promise. And that's one thing that hadn't even occurred before. All right. So this constitution, as it is drafted in 17, it, it just blows the the top of people's heads off. It is so radical in so many ways that there are so many people who just can't find their way to back it that it's an absolute miracle that it was ever ratified. Conservatives hated it because they saw it as anti-clerical. Foreign investors like the United States hated this document. They loathed it. The Catholic Church disliked it, especially because it was very clear that the state was looking to grab their land and redistribute it. Um, Large-scale landowners, especially up in the north, in like people who were uh, ranch owners, they really didn't like this. Zapatistas still didn't like this because they still didn't trust the state. They still felt that it, it didn't give enough weight and autonomy to indigenous communities. And industrialists didn't like it because it seemed a little bit communist, man. So this was kind of a compromise document. And you know it's a compromise because everybody was unhappy. But following the conclusion of the Mexican Revolution, which took a while longer, like the revolution didn't end with the drafting of the Constitution, people continued fighting for another three odd years. Finally, political stability was established under the next major presidential figure, and that was Obregón. Obregón uh, Obregón's presidency lasted from 24, like 20 to 24, and Calles succeeded him from 24 to 28. There was no violence in between that, those presidential successions. And one thing you will notice right now is how long is the presidential term of, term of office based off of those dates? It's four years, right? That's not how the presidency currently works in Mexico, so you know that there have been amendments to the Constitution. So essentially what these two politicians do, what these two subsequent presidents do, is they try to kind of wrestle with the ideals espoused in this very radical 1917 document. And then they're trying to marry that against the existing political and social realities that they're living with in 1920s Mexico. And so they kind of compromise. They roll back some of the articles that are in the Constitution. They make amendments. They twist the law a little bit. And everybody just kind of like adapts to a new normal. So labor unions are allowed because the Constitution says they are, but the labor unions aren't run independently by workers, they're run by the state. We're looking at state corporatism here. Land reform is allowed for campesinos. So like they take land from large scale landowners who are foreign, but they leave the haciendas for the political elites. So if you were an American who owned a lot of territory up in northern Mexico um, for ranching uh, at this time, Chances are the state was going to seize, seize your territory and redistribute it to the campesino populations, um, to the peasantry. But if you were Mexican and well-connected in politics, nothing was going to happen to you. <clears throat> under, the, uh, under the administration of Calles, Calles has a number of religious reforms. Um, these religious reforms are distinctly anti-clerical. Calles is pretty secular. He's pretty like, re like not anti-religious, but very scientifically driven. And this resulted in something called the Cristero Rebellion, and which was a war that lasted from about 26 to 29. And 
during the course of this war, 90,000 people died in Mexico. It gets lost in the shuffle because, like, we get distracted by the Mexican Revolution and sort of the romanticism of it. But the Cristero Rebellion was real and violent and particularly bad um, in in some of the more conservative regions of Mexico. Um, the depiction over here of La Virgen de Guadalupe, um, that is obviously the patron saint of Mexico, um, and she was their rallying um, point. She was the image that was held at the, the, the forefront um, during the Cristero Rebellion. As a result of the violence, ultimately the state decides to lift some of the anti-clerical provisions. They basically say, okay, all right, look, um, we got to end the violence. We've been through, you know, a, a decade of, of revolution um, and now we've had three years of civil war going on and so the government lifts some of the anti-clerical provisions. Um, the church is allowed to provide education. Um, it's not the only institution that does now but it can continue to do this. Um, the church does still get some tax benefits. The church can keep some land. They get some privileges. So it's during this time, additionally, that we also start to see political parties emerge out of sort of the ashes of the revolution. And in particular, we have one political party that you 100% absolutely must know, like engrave it upon your, not just your gray matter, your soul for this one. This is the Partido Revolucionario Institucional. That is the PRI, not P-R-I, PRI. So Partido Revolucionario Institucional is the Institutional Revolutionary Party, okay? So the way of thinking of this is that the PRI was aligning itself with, quote unquote, the ideals of the revolution. The PRI saw itself as a guardian of the revolution and the state that the revolution was attempting to build. So they were like trying to institutionalize, which means make sticky or like, um, you know, solidify the ideas of revolution, violent political overthrow, which is weird because ultimately the pre will do none of those things. So like I said, the notion of the pre was initially to try and continue the goals of the Mexican revolution. And they did this by trying to prevent political violence. Um, and they did this by trying to just control the whole system. Like there can be no political violence if you control everything. If you control the military, if you control all political operatives, if you control civil society, then you dictate political action. And that's what the PRI is going to do for the next almost 80 years. They will totally control politics in Mexico. In a lot of ways, we look at this period from 1929 up until 2000 as a dictatorship. It's one party rule. Now, technically, there are other parties. Do they matter? No. It's a lot like Russia today. Yeah. So this is the inside of the Palacio Nacional in, uh, in Mexico City. It is a muralist work by Diego Rivera, who is one of my very favorite artists of all times. Um, and this is a depiction of the history of Mexico. Um, this is, um, if you look, you see depictions of indigenous people here, conquest and fighting against uh, conquistadores. Um, you see here, here is the uh, um, eagle from the Mexican flag um, consuming a snake. This is part of the um, uh, the Mexica's uh, uh, creation myth, the notion of like this is where Tenochtitlan should be built. Um, they look for a sign from the gods, and an eagle descends um, onto a cactus in a, on an island in the middle of uh, Lake Texcoco, and this is how the Aztecs know where to build their uh, their capital city. Um, so this is kind of the the symbol of the foundation of the Mexican uh, the 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 Mexica, um, the foundation of the Aztec Empire. Um, you have, let's see if I can point out a few other key figures for you. Oh, um, here is, um, oh goodness, I am blanking for a moment. I will think of it in a moment. Um, these are Wars for Independence figures. Um, I just taught about this yesterday, but I haven't, I'm blanking on it. Um, he's father, 
he's a priest. He leads the Grito de Dolores. I am blanking. I will think of it at three in the morning and it will bother me. Um, but over here, this is Emiliano Zapata right there. And then you have Pancho Villa here. And you can see um, Zapata's slogan right here, Tierra y Libertad, um, land and freedom. Um, you can also, like, it's it's sort of like a Where's Waldo, right? Here's the Spanish Inquisition. This is an auto doce.